And scientific skepticism is a term that was coined by a, a renowned astrophysicist and cosmologist called Carl Sagan. And the ethos of scientific skepticism is basically to value the process, process of science and evidence-based practice above any and all conclusions that might result. It's about eliminating bias. It's about humility. It's about honest inquiry and academic integrity. The Triathlon Show 239. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Nick Tiller. Nick is a PhD in exercise physiology and respiratory medicine at uh, Harbor UCLA Medical Center. In addition to his uh, academic career, he writes about science, health, exercise, critical thinking, philosophy, and ultramarathoning. He is himself uh, an ultramarathoner and endurance athlete, and he is the author of the newly released The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, Confronting Myths of the Health and Fitness Industry, and that is the topic of our interview today. But before we get into that, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Precision Hydration make electrolytes in different sodium concentrations, so you can match your sodium intake to how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And you can get a great ballpark estimate for how much sodium you are actually losing for free in uh, just uh, a few quick minutes by going to precisionhydration.com and taking their free online sweat test, which is uh, a quiz consisting of 10 questions or so. And uh, the results from this quiz have been validated against actual sweat testing data by taken by medical grade equipment. So it will be a good ballpark estimate and can give you a great idea of where to start figuring out your hydration strategy, which is especially important for races that are longer, like we're talking about half and full Ironman races, for example, and especially if they are in hot or humid climates. You can also get 15% off your electrolytes with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka has in the last few years really, really made headway in the eyewear category. And with uh, the new prescription glasses and sunglasses product lines, especially, they uh, they really have made a dent in that uh, in that niche. And personally, I have had uh, the pleasure of trying out several different options. And uh, my current favorites are definitely the Matador sunglasses for my training and actually also for just casual streetwear. I, I like the look of them. And uh, for prescription glasses, because I do wear contact lenses, but when I get up early in the morning, I like to give my eyes a couple of hours of not wearing them to not uh, get my eyes too tired. Then I wear the Rory prescription glasses from Roka and I really, really like them and all their features. Uh, check them out or check out the traditional wetsuits, tri suits, and other triathlon equipment that Roka are well known for as well on Roka.com and get uh, 20% off your order with the promo code that you can find on Roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, here's the interview with uh, Dr. Nick Tiller. So welcome to that triathlon show, Nick. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm pretty good. How are you? Not too bad at all. Not too bad. Uh, excited about uh, getting into this interview. Uh, but uh, before we get into the, the main topic, let's start by you just telling us a little bit more about yourself and your background. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I, I come from a my, my name is Nick Tiller, and I come from a, a sports science background. I did my undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science in the UK at a university called the University of Hertfordshire, which is just outside North London. And I knew very early on that while sport and exercise science was my domain of study, I was particularly interested in physiology, exercise physiology. So I stayed at that university for an extra year to do my master's in exercise physiology and there were aspects of applied sports nutrition in there as well and at that time I I decided that I wanted to work in the applied setting I wanted to work in sports 
And so I kind of was volunteering my time and trying to develop as much experience as possible and was very fortunate then to get a job in the applied sector working on various Olympic performance programs around the UK. And I, I stayed there for a couple of years. But what I what I discovered was that actually I, I was in love with the science. I was interested in a, in in performance sport, but my, my real passion was the science. So I decided to do my PhD in applied physiology at Brunel University in West London. And uh, after that, I went into academia. And I my, my previous appointment was as associate professor in applied physiology in the UK. And then more recently in the last year, I've moved to Los Angeles to take on a job as a research fellow in exercise physiology at Harbour UCLA. So, and that's where I am at the moment. And uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the new book that you have. First of all, we're recording this at uh, the end of April, but uh, the interview will be released very early June or late May. I can't remember the exact date, but around that time frame. So uh, tell us about your book, the name of it, and when it will be released, and then the story behind it, and why you decided to write it. Sure. Well, the book is called The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science. And the subtitle is Confronting Myths of the Health and Fitness Industry. So as I as I mentioned, I, I came through this with this sports science background and I've worked as an applied practitioner in sport. So I, I had a I had I guess formal training in science, but I wouldn't necessarily before I started my PhD, certainly I wouldn't I wouldn't have described myself as a critical thinker. And I got into critical thinking more formally, probably around 2006, 2007, towards the end of my master's. And I was looking for some science-based content on iTunes. And I just happened to stumble across a podcast called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And uh, superficially, it's just a a group who talk about science and, and the latest discoveries, science news items. But Beneath the surface, it's that it was actually my window, my gateway, I suppose, into this whole world of critical thinking and what we call scientific skepticism. And scientific skepticism is a term that was coined by a, a renowned astrophysicist and cosmologist called Carl Sagan. And the ethos of scientific skepticism is basically to value the process, process of science and evidence-based practice above any and all conclusions that might result. It's about eliminating bias. It's about humility. It's about honest inquiry and academic integrity. The more and more that I got into this this whole kind of movement of scientific skepticism, the more I realized that its values were in stark contrast to those values that we see in the modern commercialist health and fitness industry. So the book really is a unification of my two passions, sport and exercise science, and particularly physiology, and this movement of scientific skepticism. And I'm talking about the latter kind of in the context of health and fitness, which is obviously something that I'm that I'm very passionate about. So the book really is about uh, confronting the health and fitness industry, talking about the products that are available that are sold to us on a daily basis, the evidence or the lack thereof, for their efficacy, and it's really about how people can navigate this very commercialist culture and maintain their sort of academic integrity uh, as a result. So it's about critical thinking in the in the health in the modern health and fitness industry. Yeah, I, I love that you bring up the critical thinking and that you've been into it for so long. I actually the, the most recent book that I finished reading was. Uh, one called Your Deceptive Mind, A Scientific Guide to Critical Thinking Skills by Professor Stephen Novella, who is a medical doctor from uh, the Yale School of Medicine, I, I believe. So uh, I just recently got into sort of the uh, uh, this whole structure of critical thinking and and all of the, the, the nuts and bolts of it and like realizing what parts goes into it. So very much at the beginning stages, but uh, then when I saw... Uh, your new book uh, and your post about about it on Twitter, that's sort of, it's sort of all connected. And I uh, immediately thought that, well, that's going to be a perfect, perfect fit for this podcast, 
definitely, especially given the the new interest that I had in in that topic of critical thinking in general. But uh, when you think about the health and fitness industry at, at the way it is right now, what where do you think it stands on a spectrum of uh, everybody is lying and hyping up their products and uh, we are all being completely um, overflowed with just unsubstantiated claims and so on versus a select few might be doing that but actually a lot of people are quite balanced or somewhere in between what's what what do you think of the industry as a whole well my 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 perspective is that the large majority of these products that are on sale uh, have very little evidence to support their efficacy. So I use the term products in the broadest sense. So when I, when I talk about a sports science product, it could be a tangible thing, you know, like a, a heart rate monitor or a pair of running shoes or a garment or something that, that uh, or, or a supplement or, or um, a particular diet that you might follow. It could be something more abstract, like a training program or a concept. So anytime some, somebody is trying to persuade you to their perspective, they are selling a product. And what we have to remember is that, that the health and fitness industry worldwide is, is, is valued at approximately $4 trillion. And, you know, that's, that's a, a mind-bogglingly bogglingly, uh, high number. I can't even get my head around how what four trillion dollars even represents but that's because everybody in some capacity is interested in health and fitness whether you're you're a high level athlete or just a regular exerciser somebody who who exercises just recreationally or whether you're just interested in keeping fit or you've followed everyone at some point has followed a diet of some description so we're all consumers in this industry and uh, unfortunately you know, it is this. This is an industry. People within the industry want to make money. It is a business, and whenever something is being sold for monetary gain, then there's a conflict of interest. So we can't assume that that everything that we're being sold is necessarily being sold to us with the with with the with the right motives. I'm sure some people who are making these products do care about our health, do care about our sporting prowess or or performance. But we, we can't take that as a given. Now, sports science particularly is quite a young endeavor. You know, if you look at the formal research into this area, maybe only goes back, if you're being generous, maybe 75 to 100 years. But, but I think sports science in its modern incarnation is much, much younger than that. And because of that, it's much more open to interpretation and exploitation by the health and fitness industry. When you Add to that the fact that there isn't really any formal governance on the products that are sold. There's a little bit more, um, I suppose, regulation in the sports supplement industry. But for the most part, as long as something isn't claiming to be a treatment for a particular illness, and as long as it doesn't contain any drugs, then people can and do make whatever claims they like about their products and they don't have to provide any evidence for efficacy. And this is the problem that we get into with the modern health and fitness industry. So un unfortunately, yes, there are some products that do work and that are evidence-based, but the vast majority of them, uh, if, if they were subjected to closer scrutiny, wouldn't do what, what they are purported to. And, and I guess another other thing to consider here is that uh, when we think about what uh, being a consumer in the health and fitness market means, it goes beyond buying products or services, but even just consuming content. People listening to this podcast are consumers of this podcast, even though it's completely free. But at the end of the day, they're like to some extent... Uh, obviously I want people to listen to this podcast so in a way I'm trying to sell people on that and I hope that this podcast is one that is valuable for the listeners but uh, in many ways it, there might be people in the industry that uh, really try to sell their content and their opinions in a quite strong way as sort of a gateway drug to uh, 
to buying a supplement or something something to that effect so even the things that we're not directly paying for we are still consumers of and, and still need to have a bit of a filter on would you agree with that oh absolutely yeah everything that is everybody's trying to sell something as and as i alluded to it's not necessarily that somebody is selling something for monetary gain but but everyone's got a product that they are trying to sell in some capacity and when we look at the way that the internet and particularly social media has influenced the way that we communicate it's influenced so heavily the way that we have access to data the uh, our the, the human genome developed f- for one thing but but the but our modern society and modern culture has changed and and uh, developed far quicker than our genes have been able to adapt as well so so our logic and our critical faculties really have not evolved to be able to deal with the modern commercialist culture that is characterized by bad science and fake news and social media. And everybody's trying to sell something. And that is why we need resources that are going to help us to sharpen our critical faculties and our critical thinking tools so that we are better able to make decisions on what is information and what is misinformation, what is valuable and what isn't, you know, what to, what to use and assimilate and what to discard. And a lot of people get that dead wrong. And I, you know, and I still make these mistakes sometimes, but as long as we're making an effort to eliminate bias and sharpen our critical faculties, then we're doing everything that we can. So let's get into that then. And perhaps start, first we start from the end of, why are we generally uh, speaking very susceptible to uh, unsubstantiated claims and uh, and marketing hype and then we can talk about the strategies that we can use to to be less susceptible to them yeah and there there are a number of interrelated reasons and different speculations as to as to the why one of the speculations that i find most industry, interesting is that um Humans have developed what we call heuristics, and heuristics are um, a series of of uh, decision making abilities. They're they're mental shortcuts that take us to a path of least resistance to a particular outcome. And as I mentioned earlier, when when the human genome was evolving, and even the pre human genome, and, and if you look at the existing ape species that are alive today these kind of shortcut seeking behaviors were very, very important because we depended heavily on them to forage and hunt for food when we were hunter gatherers. So heuristic thinking helped us to conserve energy in times of calorific scarcity. And those individuals who exhibited the greatest economy of thought inevitably found more food and were like more likely to survive and propagate offspring. So as a result, the heuristically inclined genes would be propagated to the next generation. And this was very, very valuable many thousands of years ago when we were hunter-gatherers and and, and having these shortcut-seeking behaviors were very important to us. But of course, we're no longer hunter-gatherers. We live in a very, very different society. And these shortcut-seeking behaviors lead us to be interested in and have this kind of yearning for brevity and that's why we're so fascinated with these these products that offer the one quick fix and ergogenic aids and and these other shortcuts that claim to kind of offer us the world with very very little expense and uh and so this is kind of one potential reason why we are so susceptible to these kinds of um advertising strategies that that make these very very grand claims to efficacy so what would be an example of a heuristic that uh, we use in, in today's society and, and in the health and fitness uh, industry in particular? So I, I alluded to the fact that obviously these heuristics evolved initially to help us to conserve energy in times of calorific scarcity. So we have these these inbuilt behaviors which will kind of encourage us to hoard calories and eat and consume calories when they're available because there was a time when when the human genome was evolving by natural selection 
that we weren't assured of our next meal. We didn't know that when when calories were going to be available. So if there was a a large surplus of calories, then we needed to take advantage of that. Now, if you fast forward many thousands of years to our contemporary society, our modern culture is characterized by a surplus of calories, and all the all of the modern contributions that 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 uh, society can afford us. And we no longer have to work for our food. We no longer have to hunt or gather for our calories. We can go to the store and buy all of our food. And if if that's too much energy, we can have food delivered to our doorstep, as everyone has become acquainted with in in recent months. And if we don't want to prepare the food, we can order takeouts. And and all we've done is expended the energy necessary to dial the dial the phone or open a smartphone application. So. We can acquire this very, very calorie dense food with absolutely minimal effort, and this is why we have a society where one in uh, one in four UK residents is clinically obese. It's one in three in the U- in the US, and we are rapidly catching up with the US. It's projected in the next tw- uh, ten to twenty years that it's going to be one in two people that is clinically obese, not just overweight. Mind, we're talking about clinically obese, so there's a body mass index of above 30, and uh, and this is the result of this this uh, heuristic, whereby we are almost programmed to consume many many calories and to conserve energy whenever possible, and um, so this is a this is an example of a heuristic that once served a very important survival advantage but is now kind of backfiring in our modern consumerist culture. Mm, yeah. And let's go, go into some of the, the strategies that we can use. You, you mentioned they're uh, sharpening our, um, our critical thinking uh, faculties. W- what would those strategies be? So, yeah, very broadly, we, we need to sharpen our critical thinking tools. So when we look at that pragmatically, we, we need to consider the fact that we need to utilize the resources that we have available to us. Now, most people have not taken taken formal classes in critical thinking and, and the philosophy that's associated with it. Some people have, of course, if if they've majored in, in logic and critical thinking, but, but most people haven't. And it's also a problem that critical thinking is not typically embedded in most educational systems. The, the educational system that I was a, of which I was a product in the UK really lacked any formal instruction on critical thinking, and it wasn't embedded into the main curriculum. And I think this is because, again, there are, there are various reasons why this might be, but I think teachers and educators are more focused on equipping their students with technical skills, so learning a trade or, or focusing on STEM subjects. And of course, these are important because this is ultimately how pe- people are going to earn a living when they when they finally leave, leave school and they go into the big wide world of work. You have to have a trade. You have to have something that you can use to make a living. But I think we're all too quick to forget that, okay, critical thinking itself is not a trade. And there are very few instances where you can directly make money off of critical thinking, but it's absolutely critical in all facets of culture, whether whether it's politics or and, and policy, or um, or medicine or engineering or business. Having well developed critical faculties are absolutely crucial to making smart decisions. And uh, so, we, we for, by and large, we need to self educate. So we can look at books and we can watch lectures and we can talk to people and we can read and i hasten to add that having formal education as a scientist doesn't necessarily inoculate you against pseudoscience because many scientists yes that there's a huge overlap between critical thinking and science and, and the scientific process but often if you move a scientist out of their very narrow scope of of research or their or their specialty, often you find that their critical faculties are not developed nearly well enough. And you know, at the extreme end of the spectrum, we see 
medical doctors who prescribe, for example, homeopathic treatments. And homeopathy, for those people who don't know, is, is, a, is a, an alternative medicine. It's, it's non-evidence based. It's been studied extensively it, it, uh, and, it, and it doesn't work. We, we know this. It, it cannot work, judging by, by our laws of science and our understanding of how, the, how, how nature works. Homeopathy specifically violates various tenets of, of chemistry and physics but it's been studied extensively and it doesn't work, but there are still medical doctors who will prescribe homeopathic treatments. So not all scientists evidently are necessarily critical thinkers. A, a rarer example, I got an email uh, from somebody a few years ago now who was a, who had a PhD in quantum physics. And she was absolutely convinced that the movement of the moon could exert behavioral effects on the human body. So it could affect the way that we responded to certain situations and the way that we responded to each other. And this is an idea, it's kind of heavily rooted in astrology and it's been widely debunked and there are no serious scientists that, um, that, that take it, that, that, you know, that take it seriously. And here we have a, a physicist, okay, not an astrophysicist, but somebody who definitely understands the laws of gravitation, somebody who, who's a specializing in quantum mechanics, who thinks that the movement of the moon can exert effects on the human body when we know that this is, this is, um, this is evidently false. So these are extreme examples, but, but having a science background does not necessarily inoculate you against making bad decisions. So we really need to try and take steps to learn critical thinking and sharpen our critical faculties independently of having any formal education in science. Um, so yes, reading books, looking at lectures, talking to people, um, trying to minimize bias, trying to understand the marketing industry and the way that the, the, the modern marketing industry works. Uh, understanding things like there are manuals online and other resources dedicated to assisting marketing companies to exploit inherent biases that we have. So if, if we in turn can do whatever we can to understand the way that our decisions are biased, then we can start taking steps to minimize those biases. So it's a long process. There's no one simple answer, but, but it can be done. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen with time and effort. So let's dive into a couple of follow-up questions there. First, obviously, uh, your book, I hope, will be on everybody's list. It, uh, I definitely will uh, will order it and looking forward to reading it. Uh, but beyond that, what are some other resources t that you think would be good for people that might be interested in taking this a step further and really educating themselves in uh, becoming critical thinkers and understanding these these things to a deeper level? Yeah, and, that, and there's loads of content out there. You've just kind of got to go and go digging for it. And and once you find a good resource on critical thinking, particularly scientific skepticism, you'll find that it, you'll you'll just go further down the rabbit hole. So, one one of the the first books I read on on the scientific method and scientific skepticism was a book called The Demon Haunted World uh, by Carl Sagan, and um, this is a, a book that is, is very much about, as I said, the scientific process. Um, it, it explains the scientific method to lay people. So it's not aimed necessarily at scientists, but, but non-scientists as well. And it just encourages people to learn critical and skeptical thinking. It's written wonderfully. Anybody who's, who's ever uh, listened to, to Carl Sagan speak or watched any of his videos online, there are plenty of them. They'll know that he was a wonderful science communicator, had so much charisma and, and was so articulate in the way that he communicated these ideas. You can't help but, but get drawn into the message that he has to impart. So that, that was kind of one of the earliest books I read. Uh, I think in terms of online resources, sciencebasedmedicine.org is, uh, is another great resource that is updated uh, regularly. And science-based medicine is 
basically about evaluating medical treatments, but also more broadly products that are of interest to the public and, and framing them in a scientific light. And as the name would suggest, it promotes science-based practice, evidence-based practice. And one of the main contributors to that website is, is Dr. Stephen Novella, who you mentioned earlier on. Um, and his name kind of crops up quite a, quite a lot. He's done a lot of great work in the modern skeptical movement and he contributes to this website quite a lot. So that's a resource that I use frequently. And I think just, uh, as I've said, just go digging for, for content on critical thinking and scientific skepticism, read books, watch lectures, uh, go online, go onto YouTube and look up anything by, by Carl Sagan, by Stephen Novella, um, any science-based practice. And, uh, and you'll find that once you start digging around for this stuff more and more, information will will present itself to you and you'll you'll be surprised at how far down the rabbit hole you can go and what was the podcast you mentioned earlier on by yeah, Carl Sagan yeah so that's that's the skeptics guide to the universe that was very much my gateway into into the critical thinking movement um, and there there are plenty of science based and uh, critical thinking podcasts out there so um, uh, but but that was what that was one of the earliest that I came into contact with Yeah, and and I'll mention the book again that I read that I really, really enjoyed by Stephen Novella was called Your Deceptive Mind, A Scientific Guide to Critical Thinking Skills. And then another resource that I really like is a website run by past guest of the show, Stefan Guyane, uh, and that's uh, called redpenreviews.com. And basically their premise is to do really scientific thorough reviews of books in the health and diet and nutrition space and uh, yeah, critically go through them and uh, rate them on different criteria and uh, and give give the reader of the review an, an idea of whether that book is actually accurate or mildly accurate or completely inaccurate so uh, so that's a good resource as well um, you mentioned biases there uh, so can we go into what are some of the most common biases that uh, that can sort of lead us astray when it comes to uh, this uh, in in today's society. Yeah, and I I have a section um, on bias specifically because we we have to do everything that we can to minimize bias. It's, it's we we can never eliminate bias completely. We have to do what we can to mitigate or minimize it. But every decision that we make on every facet of our lives is going to be informed by some kind of bias based on the way, based on our upbringing, based on the people with whom we speak on a daily basis and the resources that we, that we read. And, you know, two that come to mind, for example, are confirmation bias and investment bias. Now confirmation bias is an extremely powerful force. And uh, the, the essence of confirmation bias is essentially that if you have a pre-existing idea on something, whatever that might be, and that they've studied this extensively, if you harbor a confirmation bias, you are more likely to look favorably upon research and evidence that, su that supports your pre-existing belief. And you are more likely to ignore or rubbish evidence that contradicts your pre-existing belief. So if we take a, a very, um, you know, a very obvious example from the health and fitness industry, this whole idea about low carbohydrate diets and there, you know, there are, there are sort of two camps. Um, And on one side of the argument, we have people that think that low carbohydrate diet is very much the way to go and that sugars should be demonized and are the cause of most of, of, our, of our physical and psychological problems. And then there are the people who, who kind of have a contrasting view. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm very much going to sit on the fence in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of which one's correct. There's, there's a lot of literature on the subject, but, but the point is, We have to be very careful that we don't automatically dismiss opposition arguments just because they contradict our pre-existing beliefs. We have to be open to new research. We have to be open to new ideas and always judge the research on merit. If it's valid research, if it's good research, then we need to take it more seriously. If it's low quality and uh, if it's flawed research and if it's flawed evidence, then, then we can dismiss it a little bit more readily. But there are some people who have already made up their minds. You know, let's let's look at a, an alternative therapy like uh, chiropractic. 
And chiropractic has been around for a long time, and there are a lot of people that swear by chiropractic for, for pretty much all of the body's ailments. When we look at the literature, when we look at the evidence that's available, it's it's really not favorable. And chiropractic, when we when we look at the data, doesn't seem to doesn't seem that that it works for almost anything. There's a little bit of research showing that chiropractic might work for some instances of lower back pain, but then probably no better than most other treatments. But but the research really is not favorable. Now, if you speak to somebody who has been using chiropractic for many, many years, maybe that they're, they're a proponent, they're a practitioner, or maybe they're a patient who has convinced themselves that this treatment works for them, it doesn't matter how much evidence you present to them, it doesn't matter how much reason and logic and how watertight your arguments are and how much data you throw in their direction. If they have a pre-existing belief or an ideology that chiropractic is helping them to overcome their headaches or their back pain or whatever it might be, then then they're going to have these natural inbuilt inbuilt mechanisms that allow them to dismiss your ideas. And so that is what we refer to as a very heavy confirmation bias. And, um, you know, everybody is subject to confirmation bias on one thing or another. And it's impossible to eliminate completely, but we have to try take steps to mitigate bias. Confirmation bias is a, is a pretty profound one. Another one that's a little bit more subtle could be something like an investment bias. And I think everyone has also been subject to a degree of investment bias. And it's basically if you spend money on a product, whatever it might be, then you're going to try and convince yourself one way or another uh, that it was a worthwhile investment. You will try and justify the efficacy of the investment. There are that there are nice studies showing that the more money you spend on something, the more potent the investment bias will be. And uh, th- there are some really nice studies looking, for for example, at, at, at uh, analgesic med- medication. So so medication that's taken for a pain relieving effect. And, and the studies have been replicated very nicely, but when somebody was subjected to a to an acute but very modest, very minor uh, pain-inducing stimulus, and then they were subsequently given some pain medication, and, and one medication was very cheap and it was in tatty packaging, and the other medication was in very refined, very sophisticated, expensive-looking packaging, and the patients were sort of primed by being told that the more expensive medication was, you know, three, four times more expensive than the cheaper one, when they independently rated the effectiveness of the medication, they rated the the more expensive analgesic as more effective at relieving their pain, when in fact the medication that that, uh, was in the box was identical in both cases. So we have these kind of very sophisticated inbuilt mechanisms which will allow us to justify an an investment, particularly if one appears to be more expensive than another. So confirmation bias and investment bias are just two independent uh, forms of bias that they they do overlap to some extent. Those are just two of very many that, that, uh, that we could discuss. One that I think is very prevalent and especially perhaps on on social media, as you mentioned, would be uh, authority bias. Well, would you say that that is the case, that that's one to look out for as well? Yeah, for sure. And and that kind of uh, overlaps into logical fallacies as well. When we talk about informal fallacies, I have a whole chapter in the book about informal fallacies that appear quite frequently in the health and fitness industry. And it's this idea of argument to authority. And uh, if if we if we recognise somebody or an organisation as being a as being a legitimate authority in a particular area, then we're more likely to take for granted the advice that we're being told. Now, of course, in some instances, an argument to authority is valid. You know, if we if we look at the, the current climate, um, we're, we're, I think everybody, or most people around the world, are subject to some degree of, of physical distancing. Um, prohibitions and and rightfully so, and at, at this kind of stage in in the uh, in the pandemic, we need to be listening to experts. We we were discussing before before we started recording this idea that 
with um with with the advent of of the internet and particularly with social media everyone's opinions are now equally valid somehow and uh and and everyone's kind of entitled to their own opinion but not everyone is entitled to their own fact and some some people's opinions are simply not valid for example if they're not experts in a particular area so everyone has an opinion on on how to handle this current pandemic and and what the isolation or the or the social distancing rules should be but the only people whose opinions are valid in this context are the experts but this isn't always the case you know if we if we bring it back to health and fitness a lot of products are sold through very sophisticated marketing campaigns whereby a famous athlete or a celebrity is pictured wearing you know it could be a, a, some football boots or a, a particular running shoe or a particular garment or they're taking a, a supplement and quite often you know if 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 a marketing company is able to get Ronaldo to to wear their to wear their football boots or they're able to get Roger Federer to wear a you know a particular uh, wristband that that is purported to exert some kind of positive performance enhancing effect then the the science kind of takes a back seat to marketing and we've seen this time and time again where we see celebrities and famous athletes who are paid uh, you know probably quite a lot of money to be pictured wearing a particular garment or taking a certain supplement and as you've as you said this is a form of a uh, an authority bias it's an argument to authority whereas actually the question that we need to be asking is to what degree is this athlete necessarily an authority on this product and should their opinion on this product really carry so much weight because after all it is only one person's opinion irrespective of you know how uh, how highly regarded they are in their field so that's a great example of a bias and an informal fallacy and the overlap between the two. And I think that one on that note one common thing that we see as well in this industry and in other industries in media in general is that uh, if we look at sort of quote unquote science and to some extent pseudoscience like just letters behind a name make somebody an authority in the eyes of many but without any regard as to what they actually did their research and if they have a phd for example or they are a professor but then you use that title as a, sort of a, a free pass to being an expert in any given field and you can have somebody that did all of their research on um, on exercise physiology but then suddenly they start making comments about general health and uh, health and well-being and uh, perhaps uh, just obesity and uh, clinical research where they haven't done their training and they don't have that expertise that others have so so i think that's an important uh, part as well related to to this bias and this cognitive fallacy uh, cognitive um, fallacy that uh, logical fallacy sorry that uh, just because you have somebody that might be an ex expert in one area it doesn't make them an expert in every single area i think that's a that's a really valid point because again it's something that does crop up a lot in the health and fitness industry is that, that we need to be judging the experts on their credentials and their experience objectively you know there was a a great study that was public well it was a terrible study but that was the point it was published uh, online a few years ago about um the chocolate eating daily chocolate will accelerate weight loss so if you eat a um, kind of 40 grams chocolate bar on a daily basis then the rate of weight loss is faster than if you don't eat this same chocolate bar and the, the whole study was was contrived it was kind of made up to um to see how credulous the the press and the media were and when this study was published and it was published in a bogus journal it was picked up and, and published in sort of um you know 100 different languages and 200 different media outlets it was it was on the bbc news it, it was published in some very well respected media outlets and actually when when you spoke to the author of the study he he came clean and wrote a blog post a very popular blog post online about how the study was contrived really to test the critical faculties of the media and the media failed and uh, and he he was a he had a phd and if you actually 
looked at his credentials. He had a PhD in microbiology, I think it was, which is very impressive. And that's great if you're a microbiologist. But in terms of uh, making statements about sports nutrition or, or health and fitness, that kind of credential is not valid, you know, and um, and and, we, and I think this happens a lot is, is that experts in one field are exactly that. They are experts in one field. But I would no sooner take medical advice from, you know, a guy at my local pub than I would from Einstein. You know, Einstein was a was a genius, but he's a, he's a physicist, not a medic. So um, we, we, we need to we need to look at people's credentials in an objective way and, and judge them on merit and how appropriate they are to be given the advice that they are. Yeah. Another uh, fun example that I just recently heard was uh, that Isaac Newton, he published more about uh, alchemy than he did about uh, gravity and uh, the l- fundamental laws of physics. Mm. So uh, yeah, that's just another example. Um, when it comes to science and uh, understanding science and what is good science, what is, not as good science and what is uh, flat out pseudoscience what are the things to look out for okay well again this is another important point because not everyone agrees on what good science is i mean if you speak to scientists who are educated in this area who have appropriate credentials and 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 work as scientists most people will agree that good science is is usually usually manifest as peer reviewed studies so it's important that that we get our information that we get our data from studies that are peer reviewed that means that it's been published in a journal and before it's been published it's been reviewed by other experts in the field it's it's not a perfect system but it's better than no system at all and so we want to be trying to get our information from studies that are peer reviewed if you get your information from an online blog, for example, <clears throat> there are no prohibitions as to what you can and can't write. Anybody can write anything they like on the internet. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's been reviewed or it hasn't, and it hasn't necessarily been screened for authenticity so or, or for accuracy, I should say. That's not to say that the stuff that you read on online online blogs and, and online content is necessarily false, but it just means that we've got to approach it with a a little bit more skepticism. You take that a step further, not all journal articles are created equal. We, we know that some journal articles publish only very high level research that have uh, that, that, that involve placebo groups and double blind randomized controlled studies and very, very high level stuff. Other journal articles will publish much weaker research without control groups, without randomization. There are journals that are devoted to alternative. There's a journal, Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and they are obviously going to be more, going to look more kindly on research into alternative therapies. So I think one of the problems that that plagues us, and particularly within the industry of health and fitness, is that um, not everyone considers all all evidence to be equal. You know, you speak to some people who make a claim and you'll ask them to provide some evidence for their claim and they'll direct you to a YouTube video or they'll direct you to something that somebody has written in a blog post. And as a scientist, we can't allow that that kind of a resource to stand as evidence. We have to be a little bit more objective. We have to look at well-controlled studies and look at the credentials of the people who are making the statements again. All, all individuals and all statements need to be judged on merit and we need to try and minimize bias at every turn. Um, it, it is complicated by the fact that um, not everyone plays by the same rules when it comes to logical discourse. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. I think that a good recent example is uh, something that went viral uh, now within this pandemic about how droplets can spread within a group of cyclists even though they keep a certain distance from each other and that was actually that went viral before the uh, the article had gone through the peer review process and it was just a sort of um i guess science by press release at that point and i'm not sure if it has been published since then uh, but uh, but i know that the the initial talk about that started way before it had been 
had been published and accepted in a peer-reviewed journal. So uh, that's just one one example of how uh, not all science has really gone through that rigorous process at uh, at any given yeah. point. So so that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, and, and in this context, you know, it's, it's, there are arguments for and against that kind of process. Obviously, if it's robust research and it has an important finding, then that there is some justification for trying to expedite those findings to the mainstream. Because if, for example, this turns out to be a robust finding, and I don't know if it's yet been peer reviewed, and I don't want to comment on the nature of that study particularly, but if it does turn out to be a robust finding, then it's important to get that out to the mainstream as quickly as possible. It is plausible that that the droplets could be transmitted from one person to another, particularly if they're outside. If you're sitting in somebody's slipstream, for example, and somebody coughs or sneezes, if they do happen to be carrying this infection, it, it is plausible that um, that those droplets could be carried beyond the six feet that we're, you know, that, that we've been given to understand is the safe distance, particularly if there's a gust of wind, and uh, and if you're if you're moving at speed in somebody's slip, somebody's slipstream. But the fact that it went straight to press release without going first to peer review is a bit of a red flag to me because we've got no way of really knowing if it's a robust finding. If if we if we take that to you know slightly less critical matters, you know, often helping to finish with the finding of a new supplement, this stuff never needs to be rushed out to to the media. It never needs to. It's never critical enough to be. Uh, for the findings to be expedited to the mainstream population. There is never a justification for bypassing the, the peer review process. So when this happens in health and fitness, um, or particularly in relation to, you know, um, a, a new drug, for example, which, you know, um, is something that has to be approved by the FDA before it can be used in, in, in America, certainly, then, you have to ask yourself, well, why are the scientists, why are the authors of these papers not taking it to peer review? What have they got to hide by going directly to the press instead of sending their paper to peer review when it, where it can be scrutinized? So it's always a bit of a red flag when you read about scientific findings in a press release as opposed to from a legitimate resource like a journal article. So again, it's just it's another, it's another thing to be, to be cognizant of when we're reading about and trying to interpret evidence. Yeah, totally. And can you discuss uh, a bit around uh, the concepts of statistical significant versus clinical relevance or, or effect size? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is kind of where we get into the slightly more nuanced understanding of scientific research, which is not something that, that every lay person will necessarily know. But, you know, you, you can acquire these skills, certainly if you've had formal science education you'll understand these concepts but but it's accessible to anyone and basically in scientific research we'll talk about something called statistical significance and when something is deemed to be statistically significant it means that we have a, a pretty good uh, a pretty good level of confidence that what we're seeing is a real effect so for example if we were testing a new performance enhancing supplement against a placebo we found that there was a statistical benefit, a statistically significant effect of using this particular supplement. And usually the uh, the alpha level is set at, what, uh, at 0.05, which is basically 5%. So what that means is that if there's a statistical significance, we can be 95% confidence that what we're seeing is a real effect and there's only 5% chance or less than a 5% chance that what we're seeing is just due to random noise, due to a random effect. So in science, particularly in, in um, quantitative research, particularly in physiology, we get very hung up on on statistics and p-values. And, and I've even had undergraduate students approach me before handing in their, their third year, their final year dissertations, and they've actually asked me, if I don't find statistical significance, do I lose marks? Do I do I get marked down if I don't find statistical significance? I mean, what a question to ask. And the answer is, of course, no. You're not getting marked on, on your findings. You're getting marked on the process that you follow. And that is what, really what robust science is all about. 
but something can be clinically, uh, something can be statistically significant without necessarily being clinically significant. And again, I can give you an example. I recently published a study looking at what happens to the respiratory system when somebody runs an ultra marathon. This is a personal interest of mine, and I've it's become a professional interest in recent years. And when somebody runs an ultra marathon, so it could be 35 miles, 50 miles, 100 miles in a single stage, their lung function declines. I think that's fairly intuitive, but it's been it's been shown to be a statistical phenomenon. So if you measure somebody's lung function pre and post a particular ultra marathon, their lung function drops statistically in a statistically meaningful way. But when you actually look at the data in a little, a little bit more detail, when you look at it more closely, what we find is that, that even though there's a decline in lung function, lung function in almost every case, in almost every published study, remains within the lower limits of normal. So they, they remain within the kind of normal expected values. So even though there's a statistical decrease, it's not clinically meaningful in healthy people. So there is a difference between something that's statistically meaningful and something something that is clinically meaningful. And we have to take this nuanced approach because every scientific study is going to talk about statistical significance, but whether it's clinically meaningful or whether it's meaningful in the applied setting in the real world is kind of another question. So we've got to be able, we've got to have the ability to, to dig a little bit deeper into the data and understand it in a more nuanced way, if we can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I guess one, actually one, one area of research that I think where this really applies is the, the area of uh, research on recovery modalities, where you will have some studies where you can find certain markers of inflammation, perhaps that are statistically significant when you use a particular modality versus just a placebo control uh, but uh, then actually when you measure performance the next day or even things like perceived soreness or perceived fatigue you don't get any any difference so even though your inflammatory markers may have been a, like slightly higher with the uh, without the, the recovery modality it turns out that there really wasn't any uh, clinically or practically meaningful difference the the day after for your for a follow up performance so so that's to to give a kind of an applied sports example of of that same concept yeah and we can look at that you know with a with a specific example there's a lot of research emerging now on cryotherapy it's becoming more widely used a lot of football clubs a lot of sports teams are favoring cryotherapy and it, it you know it's very dramatic and it's very theatrical it's essentially people are immersing themselves in cooled air and the air is cooled to something like minus 200 degrees celsius it's based on the premise that cooling structures of the body can prevent inflammation in the same way that if you stuck an ice pack on a swollen injury then it would cause a vasoconstriction a narrowing of the blood vessels and you and it would help to reduce the swelling of the injury now, whether that in itself is a good or bad thing is is currently being debated. But if you look at the evidence for cryotherapy, it is decidedly weak. Any studies that do show a positive effect have very, very small effect sizes. So the effect size is an estimation of the magnitude of the difference. So even when we are seeing positive effects of using something like cryotherapy, the effects are very, very small. Now, this the study might find a statistical significance. But if you have a very, very high subject number, for example, a very, very uh, small variance in your subject group, something can be statistically meaningful. The effect size can be absolutely tiny. If you look at the research on acupuncture, again, I might get emails on this, but this is not, this is not my opinion, I hasten to add. This is just what the research is telling us. If we look at the research on acupuncture, that there are thousands of studies on this area, the better, well-controlled, more sophisticated studies show that it doesn't work. And in very rare cases where acupuncture does seem to have a positive effect, the effect is tiny. It's absolutely minuscule, and it's certainly not going to be clinically significant. So a lot of scientists and medics and researchers 
don't think that we should be spending any more time looking at this avenue of research because it doesn't seem to have an effect. And where there is an effect in rare cases, the effect is absolutely tiny. So it's important to understand the kind of the nuanced differences between statistical significance, clinical significance, and the magnitude of the effect as well. And what you mentioned there previously with the inflammation now being a, de a debated topic, whether reduced inflammation actually is even good in the first place because it might be part of the adaptive signal, that brings up the the important concept as well of knowing, well, what are we studying and and is what we're studying, is that actually something that is desirable and that we want to be looking at? So it's easy for whatever supplement or recovery modality or uh, any kind of product or service to to study kind of something like inflammation and find a decrease in inflammation and they can put that under a claim of backed by research this modality works because it might reduce markers of inflammation but uh, do we even know in the first place that we want to reduce inflammation that that is a desirable thing and and the same example can be applied in in many different contexts within health and fitness that actually the claims that are made are based on premises that might not even be correct in the first place, which would be one of those uh, logical fallacies that that come up uh, quite often in, in this field. Yeah, and, and a lot of products, I would say, possibly even the majority of products are marketed on a premise alone. And sometimes having a, a logical and reasonable premise is, a, is sufficient to advertise and market a product even though there are no actual studies and no research that's that's been done on the product so um you know again to give you an example from the supplement industry l-carnitine was was marketed for many many years a couple of decades in fact as a potent fat burner and it was th this idea that if you supplemented the body with carnitine if you took carnitine tablets then it could it would increase the muscle concentration of carnitine, which is a is a fat, fatty acid transporter, it, it would enhance the body's ability to burn fat. Um, it was a logical premise at the time. Now, there's a couple of decades of research on this now showing that it doesn't work. It's it's very difficult to increase the intramuscular content of carnitine. A couple of studies in recent years showing that it might be possible under certain conditions if you infuse carnitine with insulin uh, through a, a, an intravenous cannula directly into the blood, or if you if you consume carnitine with very high concentrations of carbohydrates, then it might be possible. But but these are not pragmatic uh, applications. So for the most part, carnitine doesn't work, and it's it's again for the most part, it's not really being sold as a fat burner anymore. But it was sold on the premise, and it was sold for many decades on this kind of intuitive idea that if you take carnitine externally, then it might enhance the muscle's concentration and enhance fat oxidation. But um, with a lot of these products, and again, I use that term in the broadest sense, it's okay as scientists to say that we don't know. When we bring it back to icing and this idea that if, if you apply ice to, a, to an injury, a site of injury, a certain degree of inflammation is, as you said, is is a favorable response because we need the inflammation because it facilitates certain, it tr triggers certain signaling pathways that begin the healing process. Now, we, I'm, I'm not going to argue one way or another where, as to whether we should be trying to encourage or discourage inflammation. The point is, I don't think that there is a legitimate scientific consensus on this topic and many topics in science, particularly in the health and fitness industry, some things we know for sure, some things we can say for absolute with, with a you know a very strong degree of confidence. Chiropractic, the, the, the research is overwhelmingly negative. We can say that with a you know a large degree of confidence. Carnitine almost certainly doesn't do what it's purported to do. We can say that with with strict confidence. With many things, we we can be very very confident. Some other things. The research is conflicting. There's no clear scientific consensus. And as a good scientist, you have, sometimes you just have to put your hands up and say, you know what, I think I'm just going to reserve judgment on this because there's not enough evidence one way or another to make a really distinct judgment. And humans are pattern-seeking animals. We like to have answers to problems. 
And if we don't have answers, then we'll often make up those answers. We'll fill in the gaps as and where we, we like. And as scientists and as good critical thinkers, we need to be able to recognize when we're not able to do that. We have to be comfortable with the unknown and, um, and be comfortable with ignorance. Um, as said, we have to be um, aware of the reach of our own ignorance and not ignorant to it. You know, and, and that, that's really important for a scientist. You, you have to be aware of the of the reach of your own ignorance and be okay with it. Yeah, those, those are some fant- fantastic points. And, and I think the, the concept of uh, scientific consensus is one that we should dive a little bit deeper in because that's one that I think is, is so important because it's just so easy and that we discussed that already. The media jumps onto one single study like the chocolate one eating a chocolate bar every day and you'll lose accelerate weight loss uh, that, that's just an easy example of where things go wrong and uh, it would have been easy to uh, to not make that mistake for the media outlets by just taking a quick look at is there any sort of scientific consensus consensus around this and uh, how can we do that first what do you think is uh, what is a threshold for scientific consensus is it like a big meta analysis or several of them or just uh, can you elaborate on that in, in general terms? Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the tools that is most valuable to scientists and non-scientists, I think it's more valuable to non-scientists who don't have the skills or the necessary, the time or know-how to evaluate numerous different scientific articles and assimilate the, uh, the data, is uh, review articles and meta-analyses. So so review articles come in a couple of different shapes and sizes. There are systematic reviews and um, narrative reviews, and there are subtle differences between them. Systematic reviews are trying to answer a particular question, whereas narrative reviews, as the name suggests, are all about creating a narrative to to try and um, give a certain perspective. So narrative reviews are more flexible. Systematic reviews are, are perhaps a little bit more robust because they have to set out their their uh, criteria bef- before they um, before they try and answer the question. Meta analyses are reviews of all independent studies and reviews. And meta analyses usually contain some type of statistical analysis to give you an, an indication as to what the scientific consensus may be and if there's any systematic bias in the literature. So for scientists, but particularly lay people. Getting access to review articles and meta-analysis, which have done the kind of heavy lifting in terms of the reading for you, can be really, really valuable in getting an understanding as to whether there's a scientific consensus on a subject. You you mentioned earlier that uh, the media will tend to jump on, on a particular study that has a particularly sensational outcome. And while some studies should obviously be noted if if they're a particularly high level study, if they find particularly uh, if they have particularly concisive findings, and you know there is milestone research, of course, with certain published papers, we have to be very careful when we interpret the findings of one study alone. We we have to look at all of the data holistically and try and integrate all of the findings. That's where review articles and meta-analyses are helpful. And to get an indication as to what the scientific consensus is, I don't think there's necessarily a tipping point. All we can, the, the highest accolade in science is to, is to term something a scientific theory. That There are very few um, scientific laws because laws have to be described mathematically. Newton's law of gravitation, for example, can be described mathematically. Evolution by means of natural selection can't really be described mathematically, so it's not called the law of evolution. It's called the theory of evolution. But but a, a scientific theory is pretty much the highest accolade that we can give any any kind of collection of research. It's a hypothesis that's been confirmed by multiple different lines of evidence. So there's no exact tipping point for a scientific consensus, but I think if you can assimilate the conclusions of different review articles and meta-analyses, then that'll get you most of the way there. Unfortunately, for, for most of the products available, for most of the concepts and uh, and principles 
in the world of, of sports science and health and fitness, there aren't enough instances of scientific consensus. It's starting to swing one way or another, but always more research is better. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think one important uh, point that uh, that listeners can apply if, if they see something like a hypothesis based on a few studies is to, it's always uh, useful to go and look for uh, the opposite side of the argument and uh, see what research has been done on uh, on on the, that sort of disprove the hypothesis. And that can give you some idea at least on whether those couple of studies that you're looking at, whether they might be legit or if they're two out of 20 where the other 18 actually show the opposite effect. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. There's a quote by um, Sherlock Holmes that comes to mind. Obviously, Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes wasn't a real person. But but he said, uh, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one starts to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And this is absolutely crucial in the world of critical thinking because it's always important to look at the data before you – this is what we call deductive reasoning, right? So – You look at the data, see what's available, see what's out there, look at studies for and against a particular position before you make up your mind. And then you look at the balance of the literature, and then you come to some kind of decision as to what the valid conclusion might be. If you already have a conclusion in mind, then this links back into confirmation bias. We have these very, very sophisticated inbuilt mechanisms which allow us to ignore data that contradicts our pre-existing ideas and look more favorably on those ideas that that uh, conform to our own. So whenever you are trying to get to the truth of a matter, so whether that's a business decision or a, or a supplement or a pair of running shoes or a new training program, whatever it happens to be, you need to go into it with with a clear mind, with an open mind, get a balance of opinion, as you say, look at the the studies that contradict your your pre existing notions before you make up your mind as to what the valid conclusion will be. And that by doing that, you maximize your chances of of coming to some kind of objective truth as opposed to a subjective interpretation. Mm, yeah. So finally, uh, and I had this quite uh, quite early on in our list of questions actually, but. Uh, uh, we ended up uh, going down uh, all of these strategies and uh, tools and improving the way we think about things, sort of almost in you know, a metacognition discussion. But I do want to get into some specific examples. So uh, you mentioned uh, quite a few along the way, but perhaps you can just pick a few uh, of them or of some that you have not mentioned yet that uh, products in the broadest sense of the word that uh, you think could serve as good examples of uh Overmarketed, perhaps products, if you will. Yeah, sure. So I'll give you two examples that are, <clears throat> I think, perhaps the, the the two different extreme ends of the spectrum. So on the one hand of the of the spec, of the one end of the spectrum, we have the these um, power balance bracelets. They're not so popular now anymore for for good reason, but I think in the kind of late nineties, early two thousands. The, these these bracelets were advertised and they they contain um, I think the advertising slogan was embedded with holographic technology which resonates with your body's natural frequencies to improve strength vitality and uh, wellness and this kind of thing is do, do you remember these devices or did, did you ever own one no I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> okay. Okay. that's a good thing that's a good thing because it, it means that they're far less widespread but the power balance bracelet was, um, as I said, was 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 ex- exceedingly popular in the late nineties and early two thousands, and it's literally just a little bracelet that you wear on your arm. And um, the people who developed this product engaged in in very sophisticated marketing. They they paid all sorts of celebrities and sports stars to wear this thing during competition, and uh, this, this this bracelet was worn by. Paula Radcliffe and uh, Roger Federer and professional rugby players and uh, David Beckham wore one and um, uh, all these kind of celebrities were, were, were seen, lots of football players, as I've said. So 
and you know this is this is uh, an example of the appeal to authority when you see some of your favorite sports stars and athletes wearing a particular product the science kind of takes a back seat to the marketing and there's no first of all, first of all there's no plausibility that this product would ever work because the 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 scientific mechanism that is ascribed to the product this idea of frequencies that can resonate or holograms that can resonate with your body's natural frequency. This is not science as we know it. The, these do not, the, 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 this is not congruent with any uh, understanding that we have of physics, chemistry, or biology. The body doesn't work that way. So it's completely implausible and it, and it cannot work. And when it was studied objectively in scientific research, it did not work. Now, there's a happy ending with power balance. They were um, deemed to have engaged in misleading marketing and they were fined um by the australian um by the australian commission that they're kind of um their version of the fda and, and they were and power balance were fined an extraordinarily large amount of money and they went bankrupt they went out of business but there are there are many uh replacement bracelet uh, brands that are now available on the market and they're sold for kind of 10 15 dollars each and they're still much more popular than they should be so that's an example of something that has no plausibility and has no scientific evidence. Now, if we go to the other end of the spectrum, we can discuss something like altitude training. Now, there's a wealth of research on altitude training. And, you know, for transparency, I'm not an expert in altitude. I'm an exercise physiologist, but I've, I've not researched or studied this area directly. I've, I've just read the papers that are available. Now, altitude training has the potential to have a very potent effect on endurance performance. There are mixed studies and there are lots of complexities to altitude training. So, for example, we know that some people do not respond favorably to altitude. It depends at what altitude strategy you use. So if it's um, live high, train low, so that would be living for a prolonged period of time at altitude, but conducting your exercise sessions with supplemental oxygen or returning to, to somewhere closer to sea level so you can still exercise at high intensities, but it's not likely to be favorable for all sports. And if you're competing in a sport that has a very high kind of strength power component, then living at altitude and training at altitude is likely to have a very unfavorable effect because you can't reach the high exercise intensities that you need to maintain your kind of high aerobic fitness. So the research is complex and, you know, we don't have time to go into the detail, but altitude strategies are now have now been commercialized and there are lots of uh, lots of commercial entities that sell altitude interventions to to the mainstream and so there are you mean, there are some you mean training training camps at altitude or or what sort of commercialization are you talking about so both so the, the, there are some more legitimate outlets who will run training camps but but it's kind of less legitimate would be offering periodic altitude interventions. So offering, for example, people the um, opportunity to go and pay X number of pounds or dollars, and then to go and exercise once a week or once every two weeks in an atmosphere of reduced oxygen content. Right Now, it's claimed that doing so can improve performance, improve health, and that there's all sorts of pseudoscientific claims about how Reduce oxygen can can improve immune function and this kind of thing, and there's really no good evidence that that one-off periodic or sporadic exposures to moderate altitude has any positive effect on performance. If there's any strategy that that's likely to have an effect, it's going to be a strategy like live high, train low, where where athletes are exposed for lot uh, for long periods of time to high altitude interventions but they get to train again using supplemental oxygen, for example, at high exercise intensities. But it's extremely unlikely that sporadic and periodic exposure to altitude or exercising with reduced oxygen content is going to have any positive effect on performance. And yet altitude, because it's sexy, because it's interesting, because it's novel, has become very, very commercially viable. With when actually the reality is it's a very, very complex area of research and there's a lot we still don't know. So that's just two examples of, uh, of products at two extreme ends of the spectrum 
that um, that have been vastly commercialized and that, that we kind of need to approach with our critical thinking hat on. And there's there's a broad range of products that sit somewhere along that spectrum in the middle. Yeah, I think that that example with altitude training is a really great one because it really shows uh, a, a very common example of just taking things completely out of context. So as you said, uh, it, it is a complex topic with whether altitude training works and how it works. But uh, it seems that it probably works for uh, for certain sports, and you can be a non-responder, but of course, but for responders, it it does seem to have a benefit in sports like the marathon, for example, which doesn't really have a strong strength power component. But then somebody can that has an, an a low oxygen chamber, they can commercialize that and say that well, altitude training is backed by research. Therefore, if you come and pay me to exercise in my a uh, low oxygen chamber once per week, uh, you will get faster. But the context is completely, completely different to to what the sort of quote unquote backed by research uh, claims are. So, so I think that uh, that's a perfect example to to round off this discussion with. And uh, well, before and you'll, we... you'll see, uh, to extend that very quickly, you'll see lots of companies who cherry pick information, who cherry pick studies to support their premise. And actually, the cherry pick studies don't relate to the claims that they're making. So altitude is one. Um, compre- you see a lot of compression socks. You know, we, we haven't mentioned this, but again, big business. And uh, a lot of compression socks are sold on the premise that whole body compression can facilitate recovery. Whereas actually any positive research that shows this has been done on whole body, on whole body or lower body compression. There's no, there's no actual positive data on compression socks per se. But companies that are selling compression stocks will cherry pick studies from the rest of the literature to support their claim. So it's important that uh, I guess if, if there's going to be any message to leave the listeners with, it's it's kind of don't don't take the claims verbatim, um, don't take them for granted. You have to look beneath the the superficial layer of the claim, look at the nature of the claim, and look at the evidence that uh, is supposedly supporting that claim or lack thereof. Because that's when you get a really much more comprehensive understanding as to whether the claim is valid or not. Yes, that's a uh, that's a great great point. Really good. So before we get into the the rapid fire questions, is there anything else that uh, we haven't touched upon that you want to mention on on this topic? Nothing p- p- particularly. I, I think it's just a very broad topic. You know. Um, science critical thinking scientific skepticism it's huge and i i think there's one thing just to kind of uh round off the the main conversation it's really just that developing critical thinking as i've mentioned is valid for all facets of society now in in my book i focused purely on the health and fitness industry but but you know I, i do discuss concepts more broadly and i think developing critical thinking skills in any facet of society is going to be favorable. And I think it's very, very important, whether it's in sport, health, business, medicine, politics. Critical thinking really is, is the science of critical thinking are the only tools that we have really to make valid and evidence-based decisions in the world in which we live. So um, however you're developing your critical faculties and in whatever context, um, I think it's just something just to take very, very seriously and um, and explore as deeply as you can. Yeah, and uh, with the kind of the information overload age that we're living in, I do agree that this goes far, far, far beyond uh, just our little hobby of triathlon or endurance sports. But it's something that's going to be probably even more important in in other areas of life. And and uh, your book, uh, I'm sure that some of the examples in it will uh, products come and go, but the the main strategies and tools they are evergreen and things that that can be useful for for the rest of our lives so yeah i'm really excited i'm definitely going to to order the book and uh and dig into it once we get off this interview but uh let's get into the rapid fire questions and the first one is what's your favorite book blog or resource uh, does my answer have to be rapid fire <laughs> i'll try and keep it as uh, well as i mean it's gen- generally yes but if you have a good answer i tend to be very lenient <laughs> All right. Well, this one's easy because we've already mentioned them. I think the the first resource that I really came into contact with with was the Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. 
um, science as a as a candle in the dark. It really opened my eyes to this to this whole movement. And as an online resource, science based medicine is a great place to start. They really embody the ethos of evidence based practice. So um, that's an easy one. And what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Personal habit. I think for me, it's um, people, you know, we always say learn from our mistakes. And I think learn from your successes. And I've um, I've tried to use kind of positive reinforcement to to influence the way that I approach different situations. And so, you know, there, there's a, an awful lot that, that can be taken away by finding something that you want to achieve, whatever it is, whether it's doing your studies, writing a book, running a marathon, learning to paint or a new language, whatever it is, focus on it, dedicate yourself to it. And when you achieve that thing, use that positive reinforcement to improve your confidence and your self-efficacy so that it leads on to more successes because because learning that kind of um, that behavior and learning to use the positive reinforcement will will snowball and you'll kind of get confidence to to try more and more things. Mm, yeah, that's a fantastic answer. And finally, what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? Well, uh, I don't think I'd have done anything differently necessarily. If I could, you know, I, d- I give this kind of bit of advice to undergrads all the time, and it's something I wish I, I could go back and, and tell to my younger self. We have this saying, it's not what you know, but who you know. And I, I, I disagree with that. I don't like it at all. I think knowing your stuff is really important. And I don't like the word expert, but I think we should all strive to become experts in our own specific domains, in our own specific fields. So learn your field, learn your craft as best as you possibly can. But it's not what it's not who you know that is going to influence the course of your career. It's who you impress. And that's something that I've really gotten to grips with in recent years, because you can know a thousand people. But if they all think you're a terrible scientist, it's not going to get you anywhere. But if if you're good at your job and you conduct yourself with decorum and you have high standards of academic integrity, you have a good work ethic, then you'll impress the right people. And that's what's going to take you forward. So just knowing people is not enough. You've got to impress people with your knowledge and your work ethic. I think that's what makes the difference. Right. Perfect. And finally, where can people follow you? And uh, again, feel free to mention your book, what it's called, and so people can go go and order it. Great. Thank you. So the book is called The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, Confronting Myths of the Health and Fitness Industry. It's available wherever you get your books. Uh, you can find out more information about me on my website, nbtiller.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at nbtiller. I tweet about science and critical thinking and ultramarathon and all the things that uh, that I find interesting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. It was uh, a really good discussion. I really enjoyed talking to you. Hey, thanks for the time. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. You can find the show notes as usual on scientifictriathlon.com, including the link to his new book, The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, which I can highly recommend. Also, I mentioned uh, another book in the interview, and if you are on Audible, then definitely check out Stephen Novellas, Your Deceptive Mind, A Scientific Guide to Critical Thinking. I absolutely love that. It's a long one, so it's uh, great. It gives you plenty of content for many of long rides and runs. And finally, some related episodes on the podcast that we've had before. Episode 109, Science to Practice, and episode 167 with Susan Sotier, Balancing the Art and the Science of Endurance Training, might be interesting for you to listen to related to this topic. I want to thank everybody who sent in ratings and reviews after me having asked about them recently. I really, really, really appreciate it. Can't, uh, Can't thank you enough for this. It makes a massive difference. So keep sending those in if you enjoy the podcast and uh, especially if you're a long-time listener and have got a lot of value out of the podcast, it would uh, mean the world to me to uh, get more ratings and reviews. On next Monday's episode, I interview Scott DeFilippis and Carrie Lester, who are both coaches and professional athletes themselves. So I really enjoyed getting this double perspective in that chat. Uh, they're also partners and Scott is Carrie's coach. So this is another uh, coach athlete kind of interview and uh, that will be on next Monday. Of course, on Thursday, there will be a Q&A as usual. 
Also, I want to mention at the moment of recording this, it seems that at least in parts of the world like Europe, racing is slowly but surely coming back onto the calendar. We are gradually getting back to more normal train race cycles again. And if you want to take the next step in your training and racing, then check out scientifictriathlon.com. In particular, the coaching services we offer. Uh, that's uh, obviously the, the best way to uh, get the absolute most out of your potential. But also uh, you can check out customized plans and ready-made training plans, depending on what your uh, needs are. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test and get 15% off your order of electrolytes with the promo code thattriathlonshow15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Go and check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And use the promo code that you can find on roka.com for slash TTS to get 20% off your order. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.